this evening, joining us via live stream. Uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us here this evening. I do have one announcement before we even jump into everything, and there is a blue Acura out in the parking lot, and I believe the visor is down and the light is on in the visor, and I don't know if that'll drain your battery within the next hour or not, but if I go a little bit longer, it might. So uh, if you want to go ahead and check that out when we stand up to pray here in just for a second, uh, you can feel free to do so. Our ushers are standing by, and they have a Wednesday night prayer bulletin in their hands. If you did not receive a prayer bulletin, could you raise your hand, and the ushers will put one in your hand. Uh, we'll go through those prayer requests here in just a moment. We do have some visitors with us here this evening. Met Kevin and his daughter Cadence uh, earlier before the service. They're traveling through on their way up to Pennsylvania and decided to stop in uh, for the church service. They're from Brother Tim Rabin's church, Beacon Baptist Church, uh, down in North Carolina. And we're glad that they're able to be here with us this evening. Trust that you'll get a blessing from the service tonight. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll start off with a word of prayer. And then after uh, we pray, we'll go ahead and sing our first song for the evening. It's number three in the hymnal, page number three. Come thou fount of every blessing is what we'll sing here in just a moment. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good to us, and we thank you, Lord, for getting us here safely this evening. Lord, we thank you that we have confidence that we hold your preserved word in our hands tonight and that we can study it and that it's quick and powerful. And Lord, I pray that as we hear the preaching of your word a little later, uh, Lord, that you would work in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, I pray that we be doers of the word and not hearers only and apply the truth that we hear to our lives this evening. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to lift up our voices to you now and sing praises to your name. And we pray that you be pleased with what you hear and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together page three, Come Thou Found. We'll sing all three verses. Come Thou Found of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me seated at this time and if you have your prayer bulletin go ahead and take that out we'll look at some of these prayer requests together this evening and some of the announcements as well we'll go through the announcements first and then go and look at the left side and look at the prayer requests here in just a moment you see on the right side there congratulations to Scott and Tammy Pauley as a new grandparents Presley Ann Young uh, was born on Thursday August 3rd and she's a healthy young baby, and we're celebrating with them. And of course, not just Scott and Tammy and Morgan and Isaac, but Pastor and Miss Marsha, as well as great grandparents. And I believe that's where they are this evening, is they're heading down to Hickory uh, to see that great grandbaby, and I know they're thrilled about that. And then as well, uh, June and Rebecca Pacino, uh, they had their daughters, and uh, many of you know that Rebecca has been... Uh, for many, many weeks now, and uh, they saw some things that they were a little bit concerned about, so they decided to do a C-section, 
And uh, Celine was born at four pounds, seven ounces and 17 inches long. And Skye was born at three pounds, two ounces and 15 and a quarter inches long. Uh, Mom is doing well. She has been uh, released from the hospital and uh, she stayed up there at the Ronald McDonald house for a couple of days so she could be near the baby, but they needed to come home to take care of a couple of things. But they were back up there again this evening in Huntington and uh, saw a picture of them uh, with Rahalio holding uh, one of the babies and, and Rebecca holding the other baby, so they're excited. The babies are in NICU. They're doing well, gaining weight, uh, but it'll probably be a few more weeks still uh, before they are able to come home, so pray for the family there. And then you see an announcement there about the youth pastor. We do want to thank everybody who was able to come out yesterday and help up at the house, uh, the guest house, helping get prepared for Jerry and Lauren Pettit, who are moving here tomorrow. And it looks, uh, looks fabulous up there, thanks to the work of many of our church members. And uh, we also will need help tomorrow. Jerry and Lauren are planning on getting in just a little bit after 4 p.m. And so if you're able to come over and to help them, uh, we'll, we'll help them move into the guest house uh, right up here that we purchased last year. And they are thrilled. I, I, I got a text from him as soon as he saw the post on Facebook of everybody cleaning the house. And he said it's such a blessing to see what the church is doing for them. And they're very appreciative of that. And they are thrilled to be coming here uh, tomorrow, Lord willing. So pray for them as well. And if you can help, around 4 p.m. tomorrow, we'll be helping them move into their house. This Sunday is a special Sunday, and Brother Scott will be preaching in our services. The Mylan Hayes family will be with us Sunday evening, and you won't want to miss that. And then you'll see the other announcements that are listed there as well. Uh, you can read that for yourself. Our prayer request on the left side, Cash Lawson, a good update on Cash. Uh, he had that heart transplant, and they, they closed up the chest in the last 24 hours. And uh, they're hoping in the next couple days to be able to take the feeding tube out. So he is progressing uh, greatly. So praise the Lord for how he watched over and protected Cash through that surgery. Karen Lemoyne is Vicki Cooper's cousin in RGH, Raleigh General. And then Tom Allen, Miranda O'Quinn's father, has Parkinson's disease. Keep him in your prayers. Uh, Darnell Bennett was supposed to have back surgery on the 15th and the 17th. And she put a note out today saying that She's hoping to have back surgery in the next 30 days. I believe her doctor wants her to pass a couple of tests before the surgery. So pray for Darnell that she'll be able to have that back surgery and relieve some of the pain that she's in. Uh, Butch Dutton has surgery coming up later this month. Keep him in your prayers as well. And then Mildred Malcolm had a stroke when she was down in North Carolina visiting her brother. And uh, she was discharged from the hospital, came home, and, um, and has, has had some other... Uh, the, the blood pressure spiked again the other night, and uh, she felt some tingling again and went to the hospital, but they did a, a, a barometer of test on her, and all of them came back good. And so she's now following up with her doctor and uh, trying to see what they can do to make sure that she doesn't have a recurrence there. We continue to pray for Rebecca as she recovers from uh, the C-section, and then Ross Painter is home from the hospital, and Kim Runyon is uh, Charles and Debbie Siminski's daughter, and she is low on hemoglobin. Matt Vandal is recovering from surgery as well. And Shirley Lafferty has surgery coming up on the 30th, I believe. And the surgery is on her leg. And so pray for Shirley, Miss Shirley, that the doctors would have wisdom there and that she would come through that surgery, that it would be helpful to her. Our church ministry of the week is our shut-ins ministry. And then you can see our shut-in of the week is Carolyn Irvin and Carolyn Tincher. And then our college students, Kayla Chafin, who will be going to PCC here in just a couple of weeks. Our missionary of the week is Philip and Angela Moore, and uh, they are planning a church in Utah. And we do have prayer letters for them if you'd like to read those, and uh, an address there if you want to reach out to them, and as well as an email address if you want to reach out and be an encouragement to them. I'm going to ask Brother Gideon to come up and pray for some of these prayer requests, and then mention the offering as well as you're praying and then we'll receive the offering when he is done praying. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for an opportunity to be here in your house this evening. We thank you just for the fellowship of believers and being able to be in a place where we can hear your word preached and taught. I pray that you'd be with these, crest, these uh, prayer requests this evening, many of those that are sick and in the hospital, uh, those uh, undergoing different treatments. Uh, we think of um, this good report on the babies, um, the twins, 
of Sky and uh, Celine. I pray that you continue to help them grow and uh, become stronger. I pray that you'd be with uh, the mother with a swift recovery and that you'd help them to be able to be back to 100% uh, quickly and soon. We think of uh, Cash Lawson and this good report of uh, the chest being able to be closed here in the past 24 hours. I pray that you just continue to work in that situation. We pray for um, even more of those that are sick and not able to be with us tonight. And all the names escape me at the moment, but Lord, you know of each and every one that still need your help and your assistance. And I thank you for being the great physician, even wiser and greater than anything we have here on earth. But I pray that you would just help in only ways that you can. We pray for those that are traveling and not with us today. I pray that you'd bring them back safely to us. I pray that you'd be with uh, the ministries of the church, specifically thinking of the shut-in ministry, that you'd be with those that aren't able to be here with us in church physically, but that you'd uh, continue to help as we uh, minister and encourage them. And I pray that they would be blessed through that ministry. And Lord, I pray for our um, college student of the week, Kayla. She goes to PCC, also thinking of all these other college students getting ready to leave us. And Lord, it's always a sad thing to see them go, but I pray that you would bless them and encourage them and strengthen them as they take this next step in their lives, as they pursue your will and seek out to grow more in, in wisdom and in knowledge of you, Lord. And I pray that you'd be with the service tonight, be with both the service upstairs and the children's ministries and teens' ministries downstairs. I pray that you'd be with each and everything that goes on. I pray that you'd be with the offering that we're about to receive now. I pray that you'd bless the, both the gift and the giver. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Leah, for that wonderful uh, presentation of Jesus paid it all. Amen. Well, please stand with me one more time as we turn to page number 629 in the hymn book. Page 629, love lifted me to sing the first, second, and third verse. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Love me. 
See at this time, we're going to be in James chapter 1 this evening, and I was watching the auditorium as we sang, Love Lifted Me, and I'll, I'll tell you which section won. <laughs> it was this section right here, and it's not just because my wife and son were sitting in that section. They had about 85% participation in this section right here. It was good. I, I would say second place was here, third place was here, not... Not a lot of participation over there on Love Lift. No, there was singing going on, but as far as the lifted, I didn't do it. I was afraid I'd pull a calf muscle, to be honest with you. I was sitting at my desk this afternoon, and I was uh, studying and looking over the message for this evening, and my watch buzzed, and guess what it told me? It's time to stand. Yeah, it's time to stand. So I've not got a lot of exercise today. I was afraid without stretching. I, if I did love lifted me, I'd be in trouble. But we're going to be in James chapter 1. We'll start reading in verse number 22. We'll read down to verse number 27. Lord willing, we will spend the majority of our time looking at verse 27 this evening. Let's look at verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a Hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you Seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. As we looked at this passage last week, we spent the majority of our time looking at verse number 26, talking about vain religion, or empty religion or profitless religion. We looked at some observations about vain religion. First of all, it says in verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious. That phrase seem to be is the idea of thinketh himself to be. Dokeo is the word that is used there, and it means to be of opinion, to think or to suppose. And so what the verse is saying, if any man thinks that he looks okay on the outside, he's a pretty religious fellow, and yet he doesn't bridle his tongue, he's deceiving his own heart, and his religion is vain. And so we said, first of all, that vain religion is steeped in pride. It has to do with me thinking about myself. Number two, vain religion has the wrong focus. The word that religious that was used in this passage is the Greek word threskos, and 
It's only used once in the Bible, but it's used to express the outward appearance or external service. So what we're saying here is if a person looks at their own external service and starts to feel good about themselves because they dot all their I's, cross all their T's, and they think they have everybody fooled on the outside, yet they don't have self-control with their tongue, this man's religion is vain and he is deceiving his own heart. The third thing that we said is vain religion is evidenced by our words. We could look at James 1.19, which would say that we should be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. We can look at verse 26 is the verse that we're discussing. Almost all of James 3 has to do with the tongue, and James 4.11 also mentions the tongue. And so James talks much about the tongue in this short, short book, and yet it's for good reason. Because the tongue and our words are very powerful. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You know, when we were growing up, we would hear that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I think some of us, if we were to look back honestly at this stage of life, we would say that was one of the most foolish statements that we ever made. Because I think sometimes words have wounded us far greater than any physical injury we've ever received. Words are powerful. They have great potential for good. They have great potential for evil. The boneless tongue, so small and weak, can crush and kill, declares the Greek. The tongue destroys a greater horde, the Turk asserts, than does the sword. The tongue can speak a word whose speed, say the Chinese, outstrips the steed. While Arab sages, this in part, the tongue's great storehouse is the heart. From Hebrew wit, the maxim sprung, the feet should slip, ne'er let the tongue. The sacred writer crowns the whole, who keeps his tongue, doth keep his soul. Our words are powerful, our words have great potential for good and evil, and everything I've said up until this point is review from last week. And with that as our basis, I'd like to give you just a couple more facts about the tongue before we go on to pure religion. Our words, not only are they powerful and not only do they have great potential for good and evil, our words reveal what is truly in our heart. If you would, turn to Matthew chapter 12 with me. We'll come back to James chapter 1 in a little bit, but Matthew chapter 12, we'll look at verses 34 through 36, a very familiar passage, I'm sure, but if you take the time to turn there, we'll read these verses in just a moment. It says here in verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Notice that phrase that so often we pull out of this verse. In verse number 34, that last phrase. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I've used this before, but if you'll humor me, I will say it again. So often when I was teaching young people, they would say something when you would correct them on what they said. If they said something harsh or unkind or cruel or unloving, and you started to correct them on what they said, a lot of times they would catch themselves and they would say, I didn't mean that. But if we take the Bible at face value, that's not true. Because it came straight from the depths of their hearts. What they're actually saying is, I didn't mean for you to hear that. I didn't mean to let what was in my heart come out of my mouth. What is scary to me about this verse, what is sobering and humbling about this verse, is not just that God says what is in the heart comes out, but rather that God says what comes out of our mouth is actually abundant in our hearts. That means if bitter words come out of my mouth, that bitterness is actually abundant in my heart. 
If harsh words or critical words or judgmental words come out of my mouth, then the Bible says there's actually an abundance of that in my heart because the verse says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we see from this verse that our words reveal what is in our heart. And with that, we can also make this statement, if our words reveal what is in our heart, then our words reveal who we truly are. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what comes out of my mouth reveals the character that I have. Verse 35 backs this up. It says, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. I said that our tongue has great potential for good or evil. And just like I was saying about if harshness comes out of my heart, or critical words come out of my heart, or unloving words, or complaining words, or argumentative words, then it shows what is in my heart and who I truly am. But the same is true on the flip side. If encouraging words come out of your lips, if kind words come out of your lips, if loving words come out of your lips, if praise for our Lord and Savior is continually on your lips, then it's good evidence of what is in your heart and what is truly abundant in your heart. As we talked on Sunday, may it be said of us that praise for our God, adoration for our God, gratitude for what our Savior did on the cross for our sins and what He has done every day for us since, ever living to make intercession for us, a mediator between God and man, may gratitude be what comes out of our mouth because it is abundant in our hearts. We see here that our words are powerful. They have great potential for good or evil. Our words reveal what is in our heart, and our words reveal who we truly are. But we see lastly from this verse, verse 36, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. We see that our words will be judged, and we will give an account for every word that we say. I don't know if you're like me, but I know there are some times where in my life, some periods in my life where I have minimized things that God does not smile at. Where I've thought to myself, well, that's really not that big of a deal. I've shared with you before in here that there were times where my wife helped me with this. When we first got married, she would say, you can't say that. And I would say, well, obviously I can. I just did. She said, but you shouldn't say that. And I would say, but it's true. She says, but that doesn't mean you should say it. And she would help me with that because I would have a tendency to say things that weren't always encouraging. Oh, they were true, and I would say, well, they, should, they, they just shouldn't be so prideful. They shouldn't take themselves so seriously. They, they should be able to take some, some criticism. I would justify my own critical nature, my own critical heart. But when I stand before God, if I try to use the same bogus excuses that I use with my wife, they will fall flat on their face. They will not stand. Because there is no excuse for a critical spirit. There is no excuse for a complaining spirit. There is no excuse for an unkind and harsh tone. It's not excusable. Every idle word that we use, we're going to give an account for. With that, we see that vain religion often has the wrong focus. Vain religion is steeped in pride. Vain religion is revealed by our words. And lastly, we see, verse 26 of James chapter 1, that vain religion is of no profit. It's of no profit. And if I could add something to that, I would say that vain religion is deceitful. In other words, vain religion can start to feel pretty good about itself, even though it's not accomplishing anything good for the kingdom of God. That's how the Pharisees were, right? 
the Pharisees went about thinking that they were doing a pretty good job. The Pharisees went about thinking that they were upholding some kind of outward appearance that was respectable to the people, that they held some kind of power and some accolades and that they had great influence. And on the outside, they were, Jesus called them, whited sepulchers. They looked beautiful on the outside. But on the inside, they were dead man's bones. In other words, Jesus said, your religion is vain, it is empty, it is of no good, it is of no profit. You have deceived your own selves. And here, the half-brother of James says the same exact thing in speaking to these early Christians. He says, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain, it's empty, and it's deceptive. That brings us here to pure religion. But before we get to pure religion, I'd like to give you one illustration about vain religion. When I was teaching eighth grade English, every year in their literature book, they would have to read a story called Hesterman. I looked up how to pronounce that word, and the problem is it's pronounced 30 different ways. So if you pronounce it differently, you're probably right, okay? The story was called Hasterman, and it was about a man who was well-known, and there were rumors that he was an exceptionally rich man. Now, he didn't live like a rich man, and he he didn't, as far as everybody knew, uh, he didn't He didn't show his riches. He just went about like a normal guy. But he had some possessions that were supposed to be very, very valuable. He had traveled a little bit, and in his travels, he had come across some jewels. And he had all these jewels in a box, and he thought, these are so wonderful. And he was so excited, and the day he got ready to go turn in his jewels for money so that he could use that money to be a blessing to his family. He went marching with his top hat on and his cane in his hand and his coat button in. He had a big smile on his face and he was whistling that day. And everybody saw how good of a spirit he was in. And they saw him carrying that box and they said, this is the day, this is the day. I bet you I know what's in that box. And so he took it and when he took it to the jeweler and he opened the box, he found that what he actually had was just a bunch of stones that weren't worth much at all. Just just a few bucks because of the minerals that they possessed. He went home, downtrodden and discouraged. And it was amazing. He had a a little skip in his step and he had a, a, a tune on his lips when he was whistling and a smile on his face as he was going. And yet later on he found out that what he had placed all of his happiness in was actually of no value, it was empty. I wonder how many people have their Christian checklist of I do this for God and I do this for God and I do this for God and I do this for God. And one day it's going to be revealed. Hey, your your priorities were actually different than God's priorities. And your religion is actually empty. Because it's not about impressing people on the outside. It's about whether or not you have a heart for God. And so James contrasts the two here, this vain and empty religion, and he contrasts it with pure religion in verse 27. And I'm looking forward to that because this is much more positive and encouraging. So let's look at verse number 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. In contrast to vain religion, which has the wrong focus, pure religion is based upon having the right focus, which is a focus on Jesus Christ. Pure religion, according to Warren Wiersbe, means practicing God's word and sharing it with others through speech, service, and separation from the world. Since we've already looked at great length at our words and our speech, let's focus the remainder of our time discussing verse 27, which emphasizes our service and our separation. Look at verse 27 again. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. 
Charles Spurgeon said, Charity and purity are two great garments of Christianity. We find both in this passage. Jesus is talking about the charity or the love that we show to others and serving sacrificially. And then he talks about being unspotted from the world. He talks about the purity that Christ wants us to have. So first, let's look at our charity or our service. We see the words here, pure religion and undefiled. That means clean and unsoiled. And it says before God and the Father. And why is that significant? Because who was the vain religion for? For the appearance of others, right? And to build up self. To get applause and accolades and glory for me and so that others would think highly of me. Whereas pure religion has nothing to do with me at all. It's being emptied of self and filled with the Spirit in service to the Savior. And so we see here that this pure religion is before God and the Father. And it's not an external religion to be seen of men. Matthew 6, 1 says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Ephesians 6, 5, and 7, the Apostle Paul warns the church at Ephesus, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. In singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service, as to the Lord and not to men. He repeats a similar thought to, to the church at Colossae. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. In contrast to vain religion, which has the wrong focus, pure religion is focused on Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And when we focus on Christ, just as we see here in this passage, it also leads us to have a focus on others. To see others in the midst of their needs. After we've seen ourselves in Christ in the mirror of the word, we must see others the way that Christ sees them. So he goes on to say here that pure religion is to visit the fatherless and widows. That word visit there is different than maybe what we think of for the word visit. For instance, if you dropped by my house today and you knocked on the door and you decided that you were going to start a conversation with me, I might say, oh, so-and-so came for a visit. For instance, last night during our church-wide visitation, we went in many different directions last evening. Most of the men that were there, we went to a, a neighborhood and we actually knocked on doors and we visited people, we talked to them about their souls. The, the ladies in the church actually went to visit one of our ladies in the church and to be an encouragement to her. And so they went for a different type of visit. Uh, Brother Scott and my son Landon, they went to visit other families and to have different conversations with them. The point is simply this, all of the visits were uniquely different. There's difference when you knock on somebody's door that you've never met before. I don't know how you receive those people. I don't know if you open the door or if you act like they don't exist. It's funny sometimes when you go out door knocking, and this is not all the time. The truth of the matter is, the reason that we go out and we share the gospel is because some will believe. And we had that happen a week ago on visitation when a ninth grade girl named Zoe accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. So not everybody runs for the hills when you knock on their door. But you do have those houses that you go up to, and all of a sudden you see the blind shut, the TV turns off, and Dad's going, shh, be quiet, it's the church people. You have that happen sometimes. You have the other times where the window is open, they're sitting on the couch watching television, you can see them, they can see you, but they ain't moving. They're not getting up. You have people who open the door who are very polite and talk to you for a long time. There are people who listen to the gospel or say, hey, we've been thinking about going to church. Thank you for stopping by. There are other people who are not quite as kind. It just depends. You find all sorts of different things when you make 
cold visits and you knock on doors of people you don't know. It's different when you go knock on the door of a church member. Hopefully when you knock on the door of a church member, they don't just sit on the couch, look out the window and say, it's pastor, don't open the door. Hopefully they don't shut the blinds and run for the the bedrooms and lock themselves in. No, there's a relationship there, right? So that's a different type of visit. We, We have visitors all the time. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. We had a boy named Andrew with us for about six days. He left, and the next day my family came in, and they left, and the next day uh, our son in the faith, Josh Zabios, came in. He's not much of a son. He didn't even come here. He went to the teen group tonight. He didn't want to hear me or spend time with our family. He just went over there with the teenagers. Uh, and that's fine. I'm not bitter about that. There's that, that abundance of the heart thing coming out there. But um, my point is, we love to have visitors. I know you probably love to have visitors, but there's all different types of visits, aren't there? This visit is not just knock on the door and talk for two minutes. That's not what it's talking about here. This visit is not just have some kind of passing relationship. No, this word for visit here is episkeptomahi. Aren't you glad you didn't have to read that? I probably didn't read it properly. It means to go to see, to inspect, to look upon in order to help or to benefit to look after, to have care for. That's what this word visit means. Adam Clark in his commentary says, true religion does not merely give something for the relief of the distressed, but it visits them. It takes the oversight of them. It takes them under its care. So, episkeptum ahi means it goes to their houses and speaks to their hearts It relieves their wants, sympathizes with them in their distresses, instructs them in divine things, and recommends them to God, and all this it does for the Lord's sake. This is the religion of Christ. I think all of us probably at some stage in life that have been hurting more deeply than words could even express. And I know that when I was going through a period of life like that, God sent his servants and his children to extend his love to me and my family in the moments of greatest need. People who saw where we were, cared about where we were, and had hands to help and words to encourage and to strengthen our faith, even in the midst of some of the most difficult days. So we see that pure and undefiled religion demands personal contact with the sorrow of others. It's to visit the afflicted and to visit them in their affliction. John Gill, in his commentary, puts it this way, We are to visit the widows and follow this, and not only to see them and speak a word of comfort to them, but to communicate to them and supply their wants as they may require And according to the ability that God has given, where there is true religion in the heart, there is love to God. And where there is love to God, there is love to the saints. And this will show itself to them in times of affliction and distress. And where there is wanting, religion itself is not pure and undefiled. We see, finally, these words, to visit the fatherless and widows. We've looked at that pure religion is before God. We've looked at that it means to visit. But then we see that it says to visit the fatherless and widows. And this was, this was so encouraging as I looked up these verses. The Old Testament had much to say about the care that should be extended specifically to widows. Exodus 22, 22, and 23 says, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29 says, At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. 
Psalm 68, 4 and 5 says, Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him, a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. That word judge in that verse, it's a different word to use, a father to the fatherless and a judge of the widows. I looked it up, it means to plead the cause or to be an advocate. You know what God says? God says, I plead the cause of the widow. I'm an advocate for them and their need. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17 said, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Even when we come to the New Testament, Acts 6, 1, what was the conversation that was happening? Well, it says, and in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. What was the result of that conversation and that need in the early church? We got deacons, didn't we? That they might meet the needs of the widows so that the apostles could continue to study and the word and to witness when we look at the beginning of James chapter 2, in the context of this passage, you know that chapter and verse divisions in the Bible are not inspired, right? This was put in for our help, and I'm thankful that it was, so that we can all find the same passage in a timely fashion. But this thought continues. This is a letter. It doesn't break up at the end of chapter 1 and begin at the, again at the beginning of chapter 2. It's all one continual thought. And so he's talking about pure religion, reaching out and visiting and helping the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And then he goes on to say in verse 1 of chapter 2, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and a goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are you become judges of evil thoughts? He's saying here, listen, make sure you recognize the needs of everyone and especially those who sometimes can be forgotten. And wouldn't that be to follow the example of our Savior? I want you to think about Jesus' ministry for a moment. He healed the blind beggars that nobody else would touch. He touched the unclean lepers that nobody else would even come near. He made a whole journey across the sea just to cast a legion of demons out of the maniac of Gadara. He must needs go through Samaria, if you remember, so he could save an adulterous Samaritan woman. And the list goes on and on. Those that the Pharisees would ignore or shun, Jesus saw them. He had compassion on them, and he met their physical and spiritual needs. And in James 1.27, we see that as Christians, we are called to do the exact same thing. Vain religion can't do that because vain religion is focused on self. But pure religion sees others the way that Christ does. And allows our heart to be affected by what we see so that our hands are moved to help. I'm going to repeat that one more time so that you can think about it. Pure religion sees people in their needs and allows our heart to affect us so that we can use our hands to help meet their needs. May the Lord help us to see the needs of others around us. We talk so frequently about seeing the needs of the lost as well we should because we were given the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I believe that missions is the heartbeat of Jesus Christ 
I believe that he left us here so that we could reach a lost and dying world with the gospel of Christ because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Christ came so that sinners could be saved, and he has left us here to be ambassadors and representatives for him so that others can be saved as well. And so when we speak of having eyes that see the need of the lost and compassion that sees the need of the lost and reaches out and wants to make a difference and it approaches them about the gospel of Christ. Amen. Praise God. We are right on where we need to be because that is biblical. It is right and it is pleasing to the Lord. But let us not forget to see the needs of the believers who sit right across the aisle from us when they're going through a difficult time emotionally or when their health isn't what it used to be, when their strength begins to fail. May the Lord give us a compassion there as well that says, I am willing and wanting and will help in any way that I can because that's what Jesus would do. Not only do we see the service here, but it If you'd allow me, let's just look at the separation here that we see very quickly. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. It's interesting, not only only was Jesus selfless and sacrificial in his love for others, but he was also sinless. I am not preaching that we are going to reach a sinless state of perfection here on this earth. That would be wonderful if it were true, but it's not. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Uh, the, The old nature is still present. I understand all that. So I'm not saying that we're going to be sinless, but we should strive to live holy lives. We should strive to live pure lives. We should strive to live separated lives that are unspotted from the world. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word conform means to fashion alike, to conform to the same pattern, to be pressed into a mold. And, And I think we all understand this. This world would love to conform you and me. We have reached a point where the world just wants acceptance. The world is not content with acceptance from Christians. The world wants approval. The world wants applause. And the world even wants us to promote unbiblical concepts. They're not just willing to have acceptance. They want us to buy in completely and enter into sin with them. They want to conform us to their image. Is that surprising? No, because the Bible told us that's how it would be, didn't it? God in his word told us that there's a world that wants us to be conformed, but we are not to be conformed to this world. Romans 8, 29 teaches us that we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And I can't be growing in sanctification and growing to be more like Jesus Christ and demonstrating the mind of the Christ, mind of Christ, or fruit of the Spirit if I'm a friend of the world, if I love the things of this world. I think we all understand what I mean by worlds. We know the Bible says, for God so loved the world. That's the people of the world, right? God wanted to see people saved. God desires fellowship. That's why he revealed himself to us. That's why he provided a way of salvation. We talked about that on Sunday. Okay, we understand all of that. We're we're not talking about the earth. We're not talking about the universe when we talk about the world. What are we talking about? We're talking about worldly philosophies, opinions, and behaviors that are contrary to the scripture. That's what we're talking about. And what does God say about that? He says that we are not to be spotted by the world. Why should we keep ourselves unspotted from the world? I'll give you just a few quick, brief ones, uh, answers here. Four quick, quick, brief points. I know you don't believe that's going to be quick and brief. Uh, I'm I'm double emphasizing there. It's going to be quick and brief, even though they mean the same exact thing. Four brief points of why we should keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Because it is the desire of Christ that we do so. John 17, 14 through 15, we talk about the Lord's Prayer uh, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that he would be um, 
betrayed. And I know that, that what we normally call the Lord's Prayer in the Bible is, my Father, which art in, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But really, the Lord's Prayer there in the garden where Jesus was praying to a heavenly Father. But he didn't just pray, not my will, but thine be done. He, he prayed this as well for his disciples and for those who would follow later on in their footsteps to accept Jesus Christ. He says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Why should we not be conformed to the world? Why should we keep ourselves unspotted from the world? Why do we need to have biblical separation? Because it is the desire of our Savior Jesus Christ that we do so. Number two, because a love for this world does not reveal a love for Christ. 1 John 2, 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That does not mean that if I get close to the world, that I'm not saved. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love me anymore. What it means is, I am not demonstrating love for him when I am loving the things of this world. And he explains to us what the things of this world are, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, are not of the Father, they are of the world. Number one, because Christ desires for us to be unspotted from the world. Because a love of this world does not reveal a love for Christ. Number three, because a love for this world is not a wise use of our time or affections. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. 1 John 2.17 says, And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Everything in this world is going to burn up. It is vain, it is empty, it is useless if it is apart from God. So why would we spend our life on that which is empty when we can spend our life on that which is eternal? Especially after he spent his life for us. Number four, because a love for this world actually opposes God. James 4.4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I can't walk lock and step with this world and be in unbroken fellowship with God at the same time. I can't do it. I can't love and live for the things of this world and yet have the fruit of the Spirit. It can't happen. There's got to be some lines that we draw in our lives where we say, hey, I, I can't watch that because it's not helping me as a Christian. It's actually feeding my flesh. I can't listen to that because it's not helping me draw closer to God. I can't partake in that because if I do, I will be spotted with the world. A young lady who was attempting to defend her attendance at questionable places of, of amusement told her friend that she thought a Christian could go anywhere. Her friend replied, certainly she can, but I am reminded of a little incident which happened last summer when I went with a party of friends to explore a coal mine. One of the young women appeared dressed in a dainty white gown, and when her friends remonstrated with her, she appealed to the old miner who was to act as guide to the party. Can I wear a white dress into the mine, she asked petulantly. Yes, ma'am, returned the old man. There's nothing to keep you from wearing a white frock down there, but there will be considerable to keep you from wearing one back. You can wear the white dress down into the mud pit, but be rest assured you're not going to come back with it all white and shiny. And if we think that we can be like Lot, and be friends of the world, and playing with the things of the world, and all of a sudden, still be on fire for God and have a great testimony for the Lord, we're going against what the Bible teaches. You remember Lot when he, his heart was burdened, and I'm sure broken, when he went to his daughters and his sons-in-laws, his married daughters and sons-in-laws, and he told them that we got to get out of here because God's going to judge this place. 
And what does the Bible say? They thought he was mocking. They thought he was joking. Why would they think that? Because he was so worldly, they didn't expect anything spiritual to come out of his mouth. His testimony was so tainted, and he was so spotted by the worlds, that he lost his effectiveness as a help to those around him. It's not enough to try to serve and help people if I'm going to go out and live like the devil. What I need to do is strive to live a holy and obedient life to God in obedience to Him and then follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit to make a difference in other people's lives by helping them in and through the love of Christ. May the Lord help us to obey. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together, and we pray for your will to be done in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would give us servants' hearts. Lord, you, you talk about selfishness here in this chapter, and we can't be the servants that we should be if we're living selfishly. Lord, we can't be the servants we should be either if we're comfortable in sin. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be committed to you. Lord, help people in this room tonight, people listening on the live stream. Lord, I pray that you would just help us. If there's an area of our life that is outside your will, where we are playing around with or flirting with the world or allowing things into our life that we shouldn't be, I pray that you would convict and that we would confess and forsake it. And Lord, I pray that we would get our eyes back on you and that we be used of you to help others. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.